Because right now, we don't need to hear from me. They, we need to hear from you. There's so many voices in our lives, so many voices in our world um, telling us what's, what to believe, what to think, how to act. And they're often very confusing. But in this moment, Jesus, we need to hear from you. The author of our souls, the lover of our souls, our redeemer, our creator. I pray that whatever I have prepared, um, that you would use it to transform us. That if there's anything in my notes or in my mind and heart that's not from you, that you would either remove it from my speaking or at least from our hearing and memory. But for the things that are from you, may they be a trumpet to our soul. May people hear your voice this morning, Jesus. We ask this on the basis of, of the work of Jesus, his righteousness in his name, we ask these things. Amen. We are in Acts, actually, today. I know your bulletin says John. We're going to get there back next week. Um, but in light of of the name change we're going to be talking about in the uh, business meeting, I wanted to go back to this sermon. It's been about a year and a few months since I preached this. But we are at, we're going to go back through this, this, this story in Acts of Philip and the Ethiopian. Good news for outsiders. It's a story of, of two people, Philip and the Ethiopian. And as, as I hope as we go through this, you'll see that he could be singing the song Love is a, Love is a Hammer. Because he's, he's an outsider, this, this Ethiopian. And God's pursuing him. And that's the issue with the names. Uh, you know, if you don't know what the names, two names are that we're going to vote on. Um, one is As You Are and the other is Open Door. And both of those capture what is happening here in this story. That, that God is going after people who don't quite fit. The setup begins here in verse 26. Actually, it starts before that. In chapter, uh, chapter 8, we see, uh, we see the, the, the church being scattered throughout the area because of Saul's, um, who becomes Paul's, uh, just a persecution of the church. And they go all over the place. And Philip goes down to Samaria, and there he starts a church. It's a big church. But then in verse 26... It says, now an angel of the Lord came to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the land that goes south down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a desert place. And he arose and he went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, let's just pause right here for a second. Okay, so we have Philip and he's. He's a pastor of this big church, and somewhere in the middle of this, he says, okay, what I want you to do is just go. Doesn't explain where he's going. It doesn't explain what he's supposed to do. He just says, okay, I know you're a, you're a pastor in a big Portland church. I want you to just get down on 99 and just start walking. Because look at the text. He says, I want you to go south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem down to God through Gaza, it's on the way back into Egypt. There's this main big thoroughfare from Jerusalem down the coast, down into to Egypt and Africa and all of that. And he just says, I want you to just go down to that road. That's it. And what's amazing is Philip does it. How many pastors of a large church would do that? Would just abandon their church and just start walking? But Philip does. And he goes down there and he meets a caravan. And in that caravan is this, as we see here, it's an Ethiopian. He arose and he went and he went there. There was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Now, okay, he's an Ethiopian, so he's dark-skinned and he's not Jewish. 
and then he's, he's a court official of Candace. Now, Candace isn't a personal name like we use. It's, a, it's like Pharaoh. It's, it's a title. So, you, so if, if it helps you get a sense of what this is, he's, he's a court official of, this, of the president of Ethiopia. That's kind of what it is. And he's a, in charge of her treasury. It's like being a CFO of a nation. He's the chief operating officer in charge of all of her money. And what we see here in these two very different people, and God's brought them together. You've got Philip, this poor, probably scraggly looking guy. He's an average Christian. Yes, he's been greatly used before in the early, in the early parts of chapter 8, but he really hasn't been very notable. He's one of the seven uh, deacons, but he doesn't really do much. But he is called the evangelist. And he runs up to this chariot, the text says. He says, he gets there and he says, go up and talk to this guy. And who is the Ethiopian? He's powerful. As a, as a court official of Candace in Ethiopia, this is a man who, when he wants something, he gets it. Very powerful man. And second, notice that he's a pious man. He's, he went, he's gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's probably a convert to Judaism. He's somebody who, who has spent time hearing about the God of Israel. And he made this trip. It's about a six-month journey to get up there. Long time. He Probably his lifelong desire to go worship the God of Israel. But he's also a Gentile, which means that even if he could get into Jerusalem, he had to stay outside. He's not allowed close. See, the law says that G Gentiles don't get to get close to God. There's the outer court where the, where, where, where the Gentiles are, and then there's the inner court where the average Jewish man can be, and then there's the Holy of Holies. That's how the temple is set up. And this guy who spent months coming, he's going to be gone about a year or more in this journey, but even after all that trip, he's on the outside. And he's sitting there and he's reading a scroll. And, and God says to Philip, go up to this guy. Verse 29, it says, and he was returning from the, for, seated on his chair, and he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And the sp spirit said to Philip, go over and join the chariot. And I want you to see one thing to begin with in this first section right here, verse 28, excuse me, 26 through 29, is the word go. It's said three times. God is pursuing this man. Who's doing the, who's doing the pursuing? Who's initiating? Is Philip initiating? Well, kind of. Is the Ethiopian initiating anything? No, it's the angel of the Lord and the Spirit who says to Philip, go. God is pursuing this man. And he's telling Philip to go talk to him. He doesn't even actually have to tell him to talk. He just says, go connect with the chariot. And Philip knows what to do at that point. Philip is, just, Philip is just being obedient. God is pursuing people. You know, we spend a lot of our time being very distracted as Christians. With politics, with work. But God's not distracted. What is Jesus doing right now? Literally, in this moment, he's going after people. If you look back at the beginning of Acts, the very first 
chapter, in the very first verse, it says Jesus began to do stuff. Look back. You see that? Look at verse 1. I pointed it out before, but I want, to, I want you to see it again. Acts is a part two written by, by Luke. In my first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. And the implication is, is from Luke's perspective, the Gospels, the, the Gospel of Luke, all of what he's been saying up to that point, is all that Jesus began to do and that he's continuing to do something. And right here is one of the places where Jesus is doing something. He's pursuing the Ethiopian. He's going after them. And what, that, and what we can see in this scene is just at the right moment, God says to Philip, I want you to go because if you go and right now, you and that Ethiopian are going to connect. And that's my intention. God is setting up divine appointments for you to talk about Jesus with the people. And the question for us is going to be, are you going to obey it? That God is pursuing people. But what is his message? And this is the part where I'm really excited about. He starts here. He goes up on this ta- on the chariot and he hears what he's reading. Now this is the, verse 30. Classes. So Philip gets up there and invites Philip to come up and sit. Now the passage of scripture, verse 32, that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before a shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told them, told him the good news about Jesus. The scroll just happened to be in Isaiah. And Philip just happens to get up there at that moment, right when he's at that point of the scroll. He comes up there and he asks this question. Uh, Philip, can you help me understand this? That's remarkable. How many very powerful men will have the humility to say, help me understand. But he does. God gives grace to these humble people. And Philip, at that moment, begins to explain the scriptures to, to this man. And he starts right here in Isaiah 53. If you would like, you can turn to Isaiah 53, because we're going to be there for a while. I want to walk through what I think Philip said. And it starts there in 53. It's the work of Jesus. In, in 7 and 8, it's, which is what he's quoting here, is that Jesus was unjustly crucified. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shear is silent. He didn't open his mouth. Jesus was, un, un, this is his crucifixion. But why is Jesus crucified The eunuch might ask, why? Well, look at the previous verse, verse 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray, each one of us, our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did Jesus die? He died for the sins of his people. And the Ethiopian goes, oh, okay, that makes sense. He's talking about this guy named Jesus, and he's dying for the sins of his people. Well, that's pretty amazing. Well, is that the end of the story? Well, no. And he would go on, perhaps go down to verse 12, where he says, no, Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 12 talks about his resurrection. Verse 12, do you have that in there? This is the end of this this section here in 53. Therefore, I will divide him, the one who died for his people, a portion with the many. How are you going to divide the portion with him if he's dead? He rose again. Why? Because he poured out his soul into death and was numbered around the transgressors. Because he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgression. 
It's the gospel. It's the core of the gospel. It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, was dead and buried and raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what Isaiah 53 is saying. It's the work of Jesus. And the, and the, and the Ethiopian goes, wow, that's what this is. Now I understand what this whole passage is about. Great. But I don't think Philip stopped there. He's got the scroll of Isaiah. And it's, a, it's, it's one big, long piece. And you just keep rolling it. And you can go backwards and you can go forwards. And he might just go on to chapter 54. In chapter 54, he answers the question, well, do you, you, you understand what this means? What this produced and it produced a new agreement, a new covenant between God and his people, the removal of shame. Verse 4, fear not, for I have, for you will not be ashamed. You will not be confounded. You will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth. And the repro- reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth, he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast away, says the the Lord. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love... I have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. It's an agreement of peace. It's an agreement where there's no shame, there's no more fear, and there's this intimacy of love and and peace. And it's a permanent peace. Verse 10, look down to verse 10. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed. But my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. It's describing the agreement of God and his people because of what Jesus did on the cross. I love you. You are my son. You are my child. You're my, the wife of my beloved Jesus. And I will never abandon you. That's, the, that's, the, that's what the cross produced. And I can imagine the Ethiopian goes, that's amazing. What an incredible God to do such a thing, to, to, to send his son on the cross to die for his people's sin, to provide this kind of an agreement. See, this is why I abandoned all my gods at home for this kind of a God. He's a, an amazing God. And Philip goes, oh, but it gets better. Let's go to the next chapter. Come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, he who has no money. Come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for which is not bread? Why labor for what doesn't satisfy? Listen, diligent to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Why, why are you going after the things you shouldn't, says God? You can have all of that. Incline your ear to me, come to me, hear with, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. All you do is just got to turn from your sin. Verse 7, look down to verse 7. Just turn from your sin. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. He will abundantly pardon. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Just turn from that. And you know what? You can, you can have joy. Look down to verse 12. It's kind of the end of all of this. For you should go out in joy and be led forth in peace. There's going to be a celebration. So you just, just come. And you can, can you not hear Philip saying to this, this man, if you're thirsty, come. And this is the part where I think the conversation would get real quiet. Because there's one thing about this Ethiopian I've overlooked. And that's he's a eunuch. He 
He just has given him this amazing good news that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you can have this intimate relationship with God. That it's available. You can have peace. You can have love. You can have blessing. And it's to everyone who thirsts for it. But I can imagine that Ethiopian going, yeah, but that's not for me. You see, I'm too broken. I'm too sinful. I'm not okay with your God, and there's nothing I can do about it. You see, in the Old Testament, the law says that if you're a eunuch, you cannot enter the temple. You can't be acceptable to God. You're defective. Now, is he a eunuch because of something someone has done to him? To be in the court of Candace, to be a court official? That often was the case. He could have been born that way. Whatever it is, Five times in this text in Acts, he is called the eunuch, the eunuch. Verse 27 says it, verse 34, 36, 38, 39, over and over. It's like this blinking light, the eunuch, the eunuch, the eunuch. He, it is the key description of him, not Ethiopian, not anything, and none of the other ones. It's that he's a eunuch. He can't be acceptable to God. And he says to Philip, you don't, there's something you don't know about me. See, I'm broken. I'm not right. I, I, I might love G- God. I, th- I think this gospel thing is amazing. But I can't, I can't be. That's good news for other people, not me. And this is where. I think Philip says, no, you don't understand. It is for you. Who are the eunuchs for us? Now, the technical answer is someone who, who, is, who his boy parts don't work right for whatever reason. And it might be because of biology. It might be because of something that happened. It may be because they were born that way. Is the invitation open to them? God is pursuing these people. People who, who the moral people, the law-abiding people of our society say, you're not good enough. Is it people who are addicts? Are they, can they not come? Who struggle with pornography? People who struggle with pedophilia. Transsexuals, can they not come? Homosexuals, can they not come? Can they be accepted? It doesn't matter whether they were born this way or not. The question is, is if they answer the call, can they come? See, the eunuch represents these people who whether through biology or something that happened to them, either way, they can't be righteous. And Philip says to this man, next chapter, look at 56. And I think when he saw 56, this eunuch heart stopped. Verse Three, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, who hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and in my walls a monument and a name better than sons, better than daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name and they shall not be cut off. 
Sabbath. Now that, 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 that's Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. 4, 9, and 10. Is, it's, it's, it's in, in, in Hebrews, he unpacks in this chapter 4 that there, is a, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And whoever enters into that rest is also rested from the works as God did. It's the idea that Jesus has done the work of salvation, and if you enter into God's rest, he's done the work for you. It's, it's, it's Isaiah's way of saying, I'm not going to trust in my work, I'm going to trust in God's work. And does the things that please him, what pleases God? Hebrews 11 tells us, that you can't please God apart from faith. Faith is what pleases him. This is all we're saying with this is justification by faith. What makes you right with God? One thing, faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That by the work of Jesus alone, we are made acceptable. Whatever sin's going on in your life, you long and trust Jesus. You want to be righteous. You want to let go of your sin. You want to trust him. He wants you. He says to all of you who are thirsty, come, come, and I will make you acceptable because of Jesus. The only thing that makes us unacceptable is to reject Jesus. That's it. And so verse 36, going back to Acts. If you want to flip back there, we're done in. Look at, the, look, look at this. They're going along and they're telling him this good news. And God provides water in the desert. Verse 36. And they were going along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he gets baptized. And so the implication is nothing. Nothing can prevent this eunuch from being in God's family because the work has been done. The work's been done. The gospel is a message of inclusion for sinners like me and you who trust in Jesus. That God is pursuing people like him with this message. He's setting us up with divine appointments to tell them it. And when they get it, what's the response? Verse 37. And he commanded that the chariot be stopped. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, who's going to continue to do what he's doing. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Joy is the end goal of all of this. For us to have his joy, for us to experience God's joy. In, 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 in Isaiah chapter 55, this, that, that chapter of come and all who eat, who are thirsty, come and drink. What was verse 12? And the mountains will rejoice. When we go through Acts, you can see over and over and over that people who got it, they rejoiced. Acts 13 says that. Acts 13. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. This is the joy. Joy is meant to be the point. And it's more than just that we get to rejoice. We're actually enjoying God. Because Jesus says in Luke 10, that when one sinner repents, God rejoices. I tell you, there's more joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And notice it's not the angels who are rejoicing, although they, I think they are too. There's, it's rejoicing before the angels. Well, who would be before the angels? God. He's still the party. Because people are coming. 
joy is the point. God's going after people so that they can, he can share them the good news and he can share in their joy, his joy. That's what's happening. That's what's happening right now. Right now. And all over the world, all over the North Marian area, Jesus is going after people to tell them about his son. That they can be right through faith in him and their sins washed away. And he can, he can come and be part of his family. And the question for us is really straightforward. Will you be responsive when God says, go talk to somebody? Will you tell them the good news? That nothing can stop them from coming into Jesus. Are you celebrating when they come? Are you celebrating your own salvation? We need to speak this message of grace. We need to speak this message to people. And that's who it is. They're people. It's not some vast group. They're individuals with hurts and hopes and dreams and longings. And they just need to hear Jesus. They don't need Jesus any more or any less than I do or you do. Just as much. Some, of, some people's sin is a little bit more obvious. It's a little bit more in your face. But nobody's sin is, is, makes them any more or any less needed of the grace of God than me or you or anybody else. They're people that God loves. So go. And when we begin to think about our names, that's the point. Will we go for and talk to people who need Jesus? Or focus in on ourselves and not the world around us who are dying because they don't have the hope. They don't know that God loves them and wants them in his family. Let's pray. Jesus, there's been so many times that I have been reluctant to really, um, no, many times, Lord, I'm shocked at the scandalous nature of your gospel. Just how radical it is. That on one hand, you don't minimize sin at all. No, in fact, anything you, you magnify it, it took the death of your son to, to pay for our sin. We have so much sin, more than we know of. Some of ours, some of those among us, are it, their sin is very, very obvious, and some of it is not obvious. But you just come and you say, your sin isn't my issue. Just, co- just come and trust me and let my blood cover it. I want to dance with you for an eternity. I want to have a party with you forever in my presence as my child. Oh, Lord Jesus, may we be these people. May we be responsive to your promptings like fill up and go when you say go, to speak when you say speak. May we be bold and, inc- and, and, and speak the gospel to people. And maybe perhaps the hardest, maybe we rejoice over their salvation and we rejoice over our our own because that's what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.